Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to my amazing panel for agreeing to talk with me about libraries today. Uh, and I'm going to give an especial thanks right at the start. Uh, Mridula, can you hear us OK? And can you even maybe see us? I can see you. And yes, I can hear you. And I can see how large I am behind you. You are dominating the, the entrance hall of the library. So <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us from five and a half hours in the future and several thousand miles away. We really, really appreciate it. So um, well, look, we're going to talk about libraries with uh, panelists who all work, uh, I guess, in libraries or for libraries or with libraries. Uh, and where better place to do that than here in the British Library, uh, in the heart of the British Library. We're overlooked, you can just see above the curtains, we're overlooked by what we call the King's Library. That's the Library of George III, uh, uh, created by George III and given to the nation by his son, George IV, who, to be fair, wasn't that bothered about libraries, I'm afraid to say. Uh, it's a perfect place to talk about libraries. We're going to celebrate libraries. Uh, we're going to talk about the challenges that libraries are facing today. We're going to put some of those challenges in uh, a historical context. Uh, uh, and we're also going to be careful to look outside the UK, especially uh, uh, with Majula here. We're going to look at what is happening with libraries in India at the moment. Uh, and the final thing I'll say by way of preamble uh, is that perhaps one of the singularities of libraries uh, is that really early bond that many of us, not everyone, but many of us are fortunate to form with libraries. Perhaps libraries are one of the institutions that we engage with the earliest outside the kind of family home. Uh, so as much as we're all library professionals or professionals yes. in libraries, I really want us also to think about that personal relationship that we uh, often have with libraries as well. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to start with a quick fire round. I'm going to ask each of you if you will just share with us uh, uh, your first or your earliest memory of a library. And I'm going to go uh, to India first and to Madula. Do you want to give us your uh, first memory? Um, OK, hi. hi. Uh, it, it was a little later in life for me than it was for my children, for example, or for perhaps some of you, but I was 10 years old and my family had migrated to the United States sometime before I um, was able to join them. And so finally, when I arrived there, um, we lived on uh, Normandy Avenue in Los Angeles. It's a working class neighborhood of immigrants. I went to the local public school, as most people in the United States do, and um, there was a library inside the class, which I think was just, um, it, it was just the most amazing thing. And I think one of the things I did very soon after I started using that classroom library, uh, where you were allowed to take a book home uh, by just, uh, it was like the honor system, you just wrote it in the notebook, in the library notebook, and I dropped it in the bathtub, the book I borrowed. And for the rest of the year, the teacher asked the whole class to think about where the missing book was, which I think she knew was um, in my care or rather in, in um, no longer with me. And because my name was in the notebook. The thing is, I think the thing about the story that has moved me and has like really informed how I look at what libraries can be and what we're trying to do here in New Delhi where I run three libraries is she never stopped me from taking another book. Um, so it isn't that I, you know, had this first glimpse of a library. It is that I kind of had a glimpse of what a library is. Um, many, many years later in the little library I run, we had a um, suggestion box and a little boy who struggles uh, uh, mightily and has a very, very hard um, life, I wrote in um, one of those little slips of paper we had provided. And uh, it said, I like the library because there is forgiveness here. And he was only eight or nine years old. He did it in Hindi. He said, Yaha maafi hai. And that, um, the, the, I just think the chance to start over as a people again and again by thinking together, thinking with everybody who's thought before us, that for me is probably one of the most 
uh, important things about a library that we make room in the library for a community to come together and, and to, to just be the best of ourselves, which probably starts with a lot of forgiveness. Thank you. That was, before you said that word, I just wrote down the word forgiveness and underlined it. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, Richard, it's the same question to you with a supplementary question. Have you ever taken anything from the Bodleian's collections home and read it in the bath? <laughs> let, let me just squash that rumour. Um, no, no books have been damaged in the course of my librarianship, um, at least at the Bodleian. My first experience of libraries was a, the public library in the town I grew up in called Deal on the south coast of Kent. I don't remember when it was. My mum took me there when I was a child. There was a small children's library section and it just became a normal weekly routine. I kind of grew up in the public library and was formed by the public library in ways which are so impossible to disentangle disentangle from my own sort of the rest of my upbringing and I think in particular as I got older and I was able to go by myself I think that act as a tea, you know teenager young person was really empowering because I could browse the shelves and choose what I read myself and sometimes ask for help some uh, and for me it was science fiction that's what sort of broadened my own kind of horizons and, you know, going to the science fiction shelves or finding out how you found the science fiction authors. And sometimes when I'd run out of books by Arthur C. Clarke, asking the librarians, are there any more you can get? And discovering there was this thing called interlibrary loan that they would bring books from somewhere else just for me you know, it was astonishing kind of thing. And then sort of discovering that there were newspapers because, you know, my mum and dad took the Daily Mirror and there were other newspapers that I could read for free there and magazines and eventually things like the Times Literary Supplement and there were records. Um, you know, there was an audio library that you could borrow and take vinyl LPs home of things that were never played in my parents' record player because they just they listened to Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and Nat King Cole which is all fantastic but you know we didn't have any classical music I didn't but I was able to discover classical music thanks to Deal Public Library and I got contacted when I wrote my book by a librarian who had been in the public library and she said it was my idea to set up the vinyl lending library and that was such a fantastic thing to hear about, you know, the agency of librarians in changing people's lives. And, you know, the amazing thing is it was all for free. Didn't have to pay a penny. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to go to Lara next. Sure. So um, I was very lucky in that I had parents that really, really um, instilled a love of books for me from pretty much from, like, infancy. Um, my mum's Parents here. in the audience. Thanks, mum. mum yeah. <laughs> Um, and my first memory of a library was a library probably about five minutes walk from my house and we walked down there. I never remember not loving books and then going into this room and there was just, it felt to me as big as this room and thousands and thousands of all these multicolored, brightly, um, you know, brightly arranged beautiful books and I was completely overwhelmed and just I never wanted to leave you know so it was always a bit of a mission to try and get me out of a library um, but yeah so that's something that I really try and instill um, in people take your kids to the library no matter how young they are you know because that love of books is just such a beautiful thing thank you and Satna yeah I feel like I should give a shout out to this place because I have this weird habit I write a book in a library and once I finish the book, I can't go back there. It's like the scene of a crime. It's like all the trauma of writing the book. Is, so I wrote my uh, memoir at the London Library. I wrote my novel and a bit of Empire Land here until COVID stopped us. So it's really weird being here on a Sunday um, and not being torturing myself in one of those rooms. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess my background's slightly different from you guys in that I grew up in a house and you know, my father couldn't read or write. Uh, my mum couldn't speak English at the time. There were no books in our house, no newspapers. No one in my family had gone to university. And I find it's one of the most amazing things my parents have ever done for me, even though 
my father couldn't read or write. Together, my parents insisted that we went to the library every two weeks. So my dad would walk us for, it felt like two hours, it was probably much shorter, uh, to his town library, where we would spend hours poring over the books. And my brother would read you know, books about cowboys. And my, my sister would read books about in, by Enid Blyton. She thought that the name was Grid Blyton, the way it was signed on the front. Uh, and I would read Roald Dahl and Jennings. Who wrote Jennings' books? Anthony Buckeridge? Yeah, I was obsessed right? with them for a while. But it was, it, it kind of, not, it blew my mind and it opened up a whole world that wasn't open to me. But more than anything else, it made me feel less lonely because essentially I was an introvert in a very extroverted family, in a very extroverted culture. Sikhs are quite boisterous. They don't shut up. And uh, I was in a, a very small house with 54 first cousins. So I never had my own bedroom. I often never even had my own bed. But with a library book, I could be by myself, even if it was chaos around me. And uh, you know, my cousins would call me intellectual and take the mickey. But I think it probably saved my life. Thank you. Um, thank you for reminding me about Jennings as well. <laughs> um, you, you've wrote, you wrote about that library you mentioned there, Heathtown Library. Uh, in Wolverhampton, where you grew, uh, grew up. You wrote about that recently, or earlier this year. Um, I think, unlike Deal Public Library, that library isn't there anymore, or rather the building's there, but it's no longer uh, an operating library. Do you want to just say a bit more about the library? Because at its time, I think it was really innovative in the way that the kind of co-location, I guess, of activities there, but then also say what happened when you went back and, and, and saw the state of it now. I guess it was, the Heathland Library was typical of a lot of the Victorian libraries. It was built by these enlightened Victorians who spent a lot of money setting up libraries that everyone could access. But as part of the library, there was also swimming baths and baths where you could wash. So it was, it was really somewhere where the working classes could humanize themselves, I thought. And it says a lot that this government or th these governments have let these things die. And then the Victorians saw the benefit. And actually, I've been in America a lot recently. You know, America gets it. Over here, there's an idea that libraries are socialist. But in America, you know, there are more libraries in America than there are branches of McDonald's or branches of Starbucks. I mean, I hung out in a very middle-class area in Florida, and the middle-class family I was staying with, they were borrowing books all the time. America understands that they are vehicles of social mobility, actually, and also entrepreneurship. If you want to research a new business, you need to come here or your local library, right? And it's so tragic that we're letting them die. And it's weird that we've got this massive campaign about free school meals. There's not equivalent anger about the death of libraries. It's interesting. I, and you made that point in your article. I wonder, is there something, and I noted that, that sadness and maybe anger as well, is there something perhaps about, um, and maybe this is one for Lara or Richard, but about librarians not being forceful enough in, 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 in defending those ideas, in articulating the need for libraries. I mean, Richard, you're a very senior librarian, but how, how do you respond to what Satnam said? I, I completely agree with everything he's just said. Um, I think it's we're close on a 1,000 public library branches having been closed over the past 10 years now. And it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful on our society, one of the richest countries in the world. And this enterprise, this great enterprise that came from the 1854 Public Libraries Act has just seen kind of continual erosion really over the past 20 years, but particularly over the past sort of 12 to 15. But I think are librarians not assertive enough? I don't think there's a generalization. I think there are some li librarians who've been very active in mobilizing their communities to resist the closures. Um, and to art articulate and argue for the value that they bring to the public. But it is a, a real struggle. And I think particularly I feel for um, the d decision makers in some local communities where they are being forced to make very difficult decisions between areas of public spending at the local government level, which are, you know, or impossible to make. And they shouldn't be put in that position. I think you know, there is enough wealth in this country to support you know, the National Health Service, good public education, and as part of that, public libraries. And I think we, but certainly, I think just to get, sorry for the ramble, to get to the point, 
librarians do need to be more assertive and to engage more in the political debate, to engage more in public policy, and you know, to make our voices heard because we see the, um, you know, the impact of the cuts at the direct level. I mean, it's easy for me to say that in Oxford University, but I really feel for my colleagues in the public library sector who are facing the brunt of this. And Laura, I mean, you were at Hillingdon Libraries before you moved to the RNIB, and we'll talk about the RNIB in a sec, but how, what, what was the state of libraries in Hillingdon when you were there? Yeah, so I completely agree with Richard in the, I think, just local government having to make those decisions about like, oh, where do we, you know, do we put our money into um, social, social services or, or, you know, do we shut one library out of 12 libraries? And I think, th you know, the fact they're having to make these decisions. And I think when you're a library worker yourself, you, you don't tend to shout about all the wonderful things you do. People who work in libraries tend to be more doers than, you know, PR people. So it, I think the people who um, manage libraries and people hopefully in charge of those budgetary decisions really need to be shouting about how wonderful they are. And I was talking to the DCMS actually earlier this week about how do we make sure that, you know, in government people know how wonderful libraries are. Should we need more data? We need more data. We need the library staff and the libraries to tell us how many people are coming in, how many people they're effectively helping, um, more case studies, more things like that. But I think libraries are under so much stress just to be able to do your day-to-day. -day. Having to do that as well is like another, just another thing to do. And I think sometimes they just get worn down. So one of the things that I do is try and get libraries to really shout about themselves a lot more. And I think having things like this just really brings that awareness. Before, Madruli, we come to you and find out the perspective from India, um, exciting people about libraries. Um, Laura, you are officially uh, a superstar librarian, is that the, is that the term? Um, you're all superstars, but you are the only one of us who is officially a superstar librarian uh, on the Zoe Ball Show and Radio 2, which I guess is a very conscious uh, 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 attempt to really reach out to the broadest possible audience. Just um, tell us a bit about that. Tell us how you, you, you had this honor bestowed on you. Um, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, how, how can you know, very popular uh, uh, programs like, like, like Zoe Ball and Radio 2, how can that be, be helpful in, in, in what we're talking about here? So Zoe Ball is like the nicest person in the world. I think she's oh, just so been very kind. Um, <laughs> we're saying I'm a superstar librarian. But I think just bringing those awareness about not just books, because everyone knows that books are important and books are so important in your well-being and your learning and your knowledge, but actually about the library staff that can recommend those books and can put those books in your hand. You know, um, like entrepreneurship, um, like if you want to, you know, learn a new skill, um, if you want to open your mind to a new culture. Um, it's, it's harder than just looking on Amazon. You know, you, you, need, you need a person to point you in the right direction. That's why libraries are just so important in that area. So, yeah, she's doing some wonderful work on radio too, not just about books, but about the librarians behind that that are choosing books and trying to um, hopefully help people enjoy them as, as much as we do. Brilliant, and I'm so glad you said that. There was, it was a theme, I think, yesterday. Those of you who were here yesterday will have heard in a number of sessions where writers were talking about, very specifically, actually, what happens when you've read all the kids' books, you're, you're, you're a kid, you've read all the kids' books in the, the children's library area, and you don't quite know how to jump into the, the, the enormity and the complexity of the, the adult library, the adults' books. And so many writers yesterday were saying that their first journey towards being a writer was, was being introduced to writing by, by librarians when they were growing out of the children's books. Um, and those memories still stick with people. It's so fundamental. But let's, um, Majula, let's go to, to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the state of libraries in India? Just the way, what, what kind, how does the, the system work to the degree there is a system? Um, uh, and then tell us what you, with your free libraries and your community libraries, are trying to, to bring about, the change you're trying to bring about. Oh, hang on a minute. You're in, Majuli, you're on mute, and I don't know if that's your end. Hi, yes. that was my We've got you, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for the chance to talk about what's happening in India. Um, I, I'm listening with a great deal of sympathy to the talk of um, libraries getting shut our situation in India is we just never really did build that infrastructure in the first place. 
So we, uh, we are not looking at libraries getting shut so much as at the moment, some very dangerous talk about creating libraries where libraries don't exist, but then having those um, libraries that are created not really serve everyone, um, especially by, um, from the outset, uh, charging membership fee. So I was listening to Satnam say earlier what it was like to be in a family where um, parents have every intention for the child uh, to access all the good things in life, reading especially, um, and, and not necessarily beyond that intention be able to control what happens. Um, in India, um, we have, I think, achieved somewhere in the range of like 80% literacy, but um, like I think 2018 or 19 was the last time the nationwide, um, I think because of the pandemic, uh, uh, we haven't done it in a couple of years, at least the figures I have are pre-pandemic, but uh, the nationwide survey of children done by an organization named Pratham, it's a survey of uh, reading, numeracy, other things, and um, something like 43 or 44 percent uh, of children in class five, so about 10 years old, like I was when I first saw a classroom library. Um, I hadn't seen any kind of library till that point when I went to the United States for a year. I live in India now. Um, the the um, the ten year old in India surveyed uh, is found uh, to be able to read a class two text um, in 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 the case of forty three out of a hundred kids, but the others cannot. So when we talk about literacy and when we talk about having um, since uh, seventy five years of independence gone from maybe about twenty percent literacy to 80%, you really have to look at like, for example, the fact that um, uh, maybe it's closer to 70% for women and look at the fact that often um, the bar for what we describe as literacy is so low and that um, the, uh, the child in class five who is reading at a class two reading level or not able, um, I mean, it's counted as a success that 43% are reading at uh, a class two level, but the ones that cannot, um, the road ahead for them is a very hard one. So um, the Community Library Project and the Free Libraries Network, these are two organizations in India that are trying to uh, bring to people's attention the importance of libraries and particularly not libraries that serve um, a small set of people, but libraries that serve all people so that we're not living in a world where those who have continue to have more so that in a family where a child is maybe the only person who has attended school and is beginning to learn how to read, but is 10 years old and is not quite bumping past the class two reading level, which is really a learn to read level and is not yet reading to learn, that child should have free access to a space. I think it was Richard who talked about being in a place where you can um, choose books or ask for help. Um, somebody else said, you know, seeing the book, um, uh, asking for more, more of the same genre of books, or uh, I think uh, being able to see what book sits next to the book you're choosing. So even if you're not always talking to a librarian, you're constantly taking in the information about how knowledge is constructed. So much of like theory of knowledge is, is, is internalized by a library member, even a very young library member. And um, for a person in India, um, very likely to be a first generation school goer, or at most a second generation school goer, um, maybe a migrant to New Delhi where we have our three libraries, to walk into our library and to not have to show proof of identification or to produce um, you know, some uh, uh, money to uh, enroll themselves. It, it is absolutely like a, a, a change in how everything about their life is constructed at that point. Um, because our libraries actually begin from looking at exclusion and then think about how we can create inclusion. And the very first thing has to be free membership which I think many public libraries all over the world um, take for granted. In India, where we don't have a national policy, where we really don't have um, 
the kind of standards and guidelines that we need, um, where we have some states which have state legislation, a uh, couple that even mention free, and where the last time there was an attempt at national policy in 1986, they did say free, but then that uh, particular policy was never adopted, and 30 years later, we still don't have policy. At the moment, I think we're just looking at like a reification um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, hardening of, of systems of exclusion. And because libraries are just at a systemic level, I mean, it was great when we shared those stories about our own individual experiences. On an Indian stage, when I'm um, on a panel and I'm often asked to begin by talking about my story, it just has very little relevance because my parents did read and my grandparents did read. They were like small middle-class people from the state of Kerala in India, one of the only places in India that has some kind of a public library system that serves the majority of people. Um, reading is, 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 is access um, in that state and was in my family. So my story has very little relevance in India. However, my experience of going to the United States and coming back to India and living here for the last 20 years I've really seen what libraries can do to build inclusion, to build democracy, and uh, been pretty um, actively involved with a number of other people in India to ask for that national policy, to ask for a broadened uh, framework and understanding of who gets to come in the door. Yes, a woman, uh, age 36, three children washing her dishes, were standing at her door, talking to her about our library. She's saying, I don't have the time. And then when pressed, she's saying, I can't read. I left class, a school in class two. I was seven years old. That was in the village. Um, she needs to be able to come to the library. There needs to be a women's reading circle where someone who knows how to read is reading with her. That's a part of how we run our library. But uh, all of the conversation at places of power in India right now are about continuing um, strategies that are exclusive. And um, the, the last thing I want to say, Jamie, the other set of questions about what's happening in UK and who is responsible for doing something about it. I think our experience in India has something to say to the rest of the world about community involvement and how it is not necessarily just the librarian, although the librarian can be involved, but like from a fundamental place of being agitated about what we are losing, um, every reader in, in um, UK should be talking about what they are losing right now and what they've had and, and, and perhaps what they had was wonderful and it could have been more wonderful, not less, more inclusive, not less. One small thing we as librarians do in our organization, which uh, the Free Libraries Network is about 150 organizations spread around India, pan-India, and uh, we, all, we all run free libraries. We are all small nonprofits that are sort of filling the gap, mostly not because we believe we can you know, achieve scale and replace a public library system or replace the public library system that doesn't even exist, but rather to sort of provoke a conversation about the need for a public library system. But the one thing we all do, um, we leave the library. Um, I'm not actually a librarian. I'm a, I'm a reader and, and uh, someone who loves books and someone who really believes in the relationship between books and democracy. So I got involved in this not as a librarian. I now consider myself a librarian, although I don't have that library science degree, but every single day I'm part of a, an organization that's handing um, tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of books are being issued from our libraries to people for free. And we do it um, in part by going door to door. So all our librarians um, have to once a week leave the library and go out. And it's not because we, a handful of librarians will make the change, but it's because we hope that when we go door to door, we're inviting people into this kind of agitated movement for libraries and that they will come in and be members and read, but also that they will um, argue for libraries. So I hope uh, um, 
librarians in, in UK are also looking at that. Ultimately, whatever strength you make will be a strength for us also. Well, thank you. And I know this is a conversation that we'll be continuing offline and connecting you with partners in the UK as well. Um, you talked about exclusion, inclusion, barriers. Lara, you work now at the RNIB. Uh, and I suppose everything we've talked about assumes that accessing a library is a simple thing. But of course, for some people, it's not. So tell us how you tell us what the RNIB is, how you got there and the work that you do with public libraries. Sure, so the RNIB is the Royal National Institute of Blind People. It used to be for blind people, now it wants to be more inclusive, even in the work setting itself. Um, so basically, my job is to liaise with public libraries and make sure that, number one, that the libraries, like the library staff themselves, feel comfortable enough talking and liaising with a large group of diverse people, but then people who have any sort of sight loss issues um, are able to be looked after and taken care of and given the right information really, and just to feel included. It is very much about this inclusive energy that um, I think naturally comes to a library, but sometimes, you know, things can get lost in the way. So most people have enough knowledge, have enough information, and I know we were talking, we had a, a discussion separately, that there are things they can do with the building itself, you know, to make things more inclusive. You can make sure staff have the proper training. Um, you can make sure that they have books or reading materials in a format that works for them so they can access all this information. But more important than that, I feel, is just people knowing that they have somewhere they can go to, you know? Um, even if they need someone to help them over that initial step or that initial hurdle, but just to feel welcome, you know, welcome in that place. And um, Richard talked about going to Deal Public Library and uh, borrowing uh, vinyl LPs. Um, audiobooks, are, I mean, there's a huge boom in audiobooks at the moment, but in your world, that's presumably especially important. Can you just say a bit about the work? that you at the RNIB do, literally creating audiobooks where they don't exist uh, yeah, otherwise. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting and something that I've just learned working there over the past year. So it's getting better now so that when a book is published in print, it normally is simultaneously published in audio as well. Um, this has gone from a ratio of like around half um, to around sort of like 80-20, which is a lot better than it was, which is amazing. So it means that, you know, people who can't read standard print have an equitable access to those books. Um, right now, though, with the, with the the laws that are around copyright um, in government is if, say, the RNIB had someone who, say, for example, you know, Empire Land came out and didn't have an audio, I'm sure it does. Um, what we can do is we can actually hire our own actors to go into the RNIB talking studios and create a book, an audio specifically for them. So, yes, yeah, so we do that. We, we create, you know, at least sort of nine, ten books a month that way. Um, and then if, if the publishers want to buy it, they can. That's wonderful. Otherwise, it's just available to um, the people who are part of the RNIB library. No idea about that till you told me, but it's a wonderful um, endeavour. And you have your own recording studios, don't you, in the in Yeah, the we do just down the road. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, Richard, um, burning the books there on the uh, table. Uh, incredible book that goes all the way back to... Uh, <laughs> it's modelled by Lara. Uh, incredible bo uh, book that goes all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and, and kind of finishes in, the, in literally the moment that you finished writing, and I suspect you could have carried on um, all the things that have happened with libraries since. Um, just tell us, what was the, I mean, you've worked in libraries all your life, but what was the spark that made you think you wanted to write a book, um, particularly about um, libraries under attack, knowledge under attack, loss of, of libraries? Um, so I, I guess there are kind of three things, uh, a broader sense of what we were talking about earlier, that libraries, the value that they bring to the public, were not being discussed enough in the public realm, um, both in the general public, to decision makers, public policy, all of those things. So I wanted to write a book that wasn't for librarians necessarily, but of librarians, I guess, um, and or of libraries. So the second um, issue was, I think, generally around um, so two things happened to me in 2018. One was um, actually going to Berlin, and I had a meeting in the 
State Library of Berlin, the Staatsbibliothek on Unter den Linden. And right opposite this great library is the site where, on the 10th of May 1933, the Nazis burned piles of books taken from the libraries of the Jewish community in Berlin and an Institute for Human Sexuality. So books on gay, queer, um, transgender activity were burned to, by students who were chanting, organized by Joseph Goebbels. And there's a, actually a kind of moving plaque there now, if you go and visit it today. Um, and as I saw that, I thought, my mum, the same one who took me to Deal Public Library, was alive when this happened. She's still alive today, thankfully. But I thought, you know, this was not that long ago. This was in living memory. But the attack on knowledge and, you know, thinking about, you know, Trump had just become president, the whole idea of, you know, that there were alternate facts, you know, this whole uh, anti-truth shift in by authoritarian leaders around the world. Um, I thought, you know, that there is something that needs to be highlighted in this long history of attacking knowledge. And the real trigger, actually, was um, one Saturday r opening a newspaper and reading the account of, uh, in the midst of the Windrush debate or the Windrush scandal um, and the, um, the hostile environment, that the same government department instigating the hostile environment, this, this attack on our fellow citizens and their right to remain as citizens in the UK, um, that the same government department actually destroyed an archive of documents that those same citizens could have used to defend themselves. And this struck me as a classic example of the social importance of the preservation of knowledge. And um, so I wrote an op-ed sort of in the heat of that moment, which got published the following week, and the book really kind of grew out of that. So taking that long history and trying to make points about its relevance for today. When I, and by the way, when I read about the book burnings, which of course I knew about, but the thing that really struck me, which I didn't know and probably should have done, was A, the involvement of students. You think of students as being in the more progressive side of things. And also some librarians, I think we have to be honest and say as well, that, that really caught me um, in my tracks. Um, when I read that, and that's how you start, uh, those of you who've read Burning the Books will know that you start there in, in 1930s Germany. It's, we know from recent experience, uh, one makes comparisons with that period with utmost caution. But when I read that, I started to think about what was happening or what I was reading about in libraries. Uh, some libraries, school libraries and public libraries in America with books being withdrawn. Um, can we make it, like, any kind of comparison between burning and banning and removing of books? Um, or is that taking it too far? Uh, I don't think it is. I mean, you know, these things start somewhere and they start some, something small. And I think there's a, a sense of libraries and librarians. Uh, the fact that we are being targeted today in many states of America is a sign of the power of libraries and the power of librarians to change people's lives, to bring di a diversity of ideas and opinion into their communities to su support marginalized voices in communities, to do all of that kind of work. The fact that they're being attacked is a sign of their success, a sign of their power. And, you know, if you look back on the comparison through history, and it's not just Nazi Germany that I talk about, but, you know, they're, they're, they're a good example. Those attacks on knowledge start small, but they end up with people being murdered in you know, vast quantities. Um, and, and I don't think that we should, you know, avoid that spectrum and thinking about those attacks as being on a spectrum. And that should motivate us, motivate libraries, librarians, those involved in public policy around culture and education to think about what is happening at the moment in America and to some extent what's happening here too. Sanam, you were talking at the beginning about America. You were in, was it Florida, you were saying, and you were uh, pointing out the number of libraries and the way that libraries are championed there, which is great. But did you experience um, any of the, the, the more alarming side that we're hearing about? And do you think that could happen in the UK? It's already happening. There was a survey out about a month ago. Did you see it, Richard? 
which said that people are going to libraries in the UK and saying, why have you got that woke book there? And there's an idea that it's the, it's the left wing doing it and the right wing press obsessed with freedom of speech. They go on and on about how we need to protect freedom of speech. But actually, they are driving a lot of this radicalization against the woke. You know, and actually, in my experience, it's both sides. It's the extreme left and the extreme right both want to censor people. I'm, I'm caught in the middle with Empire Land. I've desperately tried to be reasonable. I spend a lot of the book quoting people I disagree with, but still I'm caught up in this culture war where I can, you know, people want to cancel me and uh, come to these kind of events and shout at me. And I think it's, it's just an indication of how the horrible aspects of social media are, turning, are translating into real life. I didn't think that was going to happen. I always thought social media as an early adopter was always going to be just a bit of an echo chamber. But it's really shocking the way even events as cerebral as this are being radicalized by social media. And I'm sure in India, you know, Modi's Hindu, Hindu nationalist government are also radicalizing. You know, I've, I, I've spoken, I spoke at a charity event recently and made a, a passing remark about uh, the coin or diamond and Modi. And several people came up to me afterwards saying, how dare you say a critical thing about Modi? That's in Britain. Can you imagine what it's like over there? I spoke at another a private event at a friend's house where a TV producer came up to me from India and said, are you for Modi or are you against Modi? And this is how it's infect social media is infecting daily discourse and we've got, to, we've got to look out for it. Richard, I was struck that you wrote in um, Burning the Books that the power of the, the gaffers, the Googles, the Amazons and whatnot, um, you compared them to the power of the Catholic Church pre, pre-Reformation. Um, what is the role in this world of social media polarization? Um, be hopeful. What, is, what can libraries do um, to counteract that? Well, I, I think there, there are kind of um, five functions of libraries and archives, and, and I, I, I'd like to include archives in this debate as well. Um, I talk about them in the coda to my book, which, um, so let me, just, let me just read them out. So the first is a, a very basic one, which is about education and um, you know, that, that's been at the core of what libraries are about. That's what Satnam's my experience, Lara's experience, uh, Mirjula's, exactly the, the kind of core function of libraries. And I think in the internet age, being a, librarians are increasingly educating their users in how to navigate this world, how to distinguish um, you know, falsehood from truth. You know, so that educative role in using digital technologies using the internet is, is now a kind of growing part of what libraries do. The second f function is around the diversity of knowledge. So bringing ideas that you're not familiar with into uh, a, a safe space where readers can encounter them and not be criticized, not have that made public. They can sit quietly and read them. They can order them online and you know, download them from a library's collection and engage with ideas that may be challenging, they may be uncomfortable, but to do that in a, in a, in a kind of safe environment. The third function is around um, uh, the rights of citizens. And I think this is more about archives where um, you know, legal rights, property ownership, all of these things are enshrined in archives. They're kept in archives. You can look them up, you can follow up who owns what property, who are the directors of companies, all of these things which have a big bearing on our lives, that these ideas are in this knowledge, these facts are in the public domain that you can go and look up. The fourth is around libraries and archives being reference points for facts and truth. And in an age where in social media there's so much disinformation and misinformation being uh, spread around, Libraries and archives, I think, increasingly have to focus on their role as being places where you can trust information, where there's a provenance trail, where you, uh, you know, which is created by librarians through that old-fashioned skill called cataloging, you know, where you can trace knowledge back to its source and that you can rely on it. It's not going to disappear. It's not going to be rewritten or, or, or falsified. That, so they are kind of landmarks in the landscape of knowledge. And the fifth 
uh, function is around identity, where the identity of communities, of society as a whole, are sort of preserved and celebrated, and that uh, people can feel um, that their communities are uh, acknowledged and given the space to celebrate and be studied and be preserved. So I think, you know, that's, I, I'd like to call for these core functions to be um, recognized, supported, and funded properly. That's what we're going to rally around. Um, questions? Do we have a mic? We've got a, yes. Uh, gentleman right at the back uh, was first off. Dr. Ovenden referred to the social importance of knowledge and knowledge preservation, curation, and so on. Uh, what can be done about preventing the loss of the sense of its importance in the UK? I refer specifically to my experiences as a freelance journalist at the BBC many, many years ago, in other life, when I was working for the BBC World Service and you may know that the BBC World Service runs every month a competition for the best short story written in English by anyone from anywhere in the world. And the prize winners obviously are recognized, the short stories are read and so on. And it struck me this would be a great book to produce. Every year, the best poems, 12 of them, could be every 10 years, whatever. So I rang up the BBC archives and said, would it be possible to have access to the tapes and the man at the other end of the line at the BBC archives took a deep breath and said, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Guptara, the archives were stripped of these last week. Now, if that was the only case, it would be okay. But the same thing happened with BBC television, which threw out tapes of its own records so that now it has to buy in tapes from outsiders. And these are not, of course, all people from Oxford or Cambridge. Nevertheless, they're not entirely uneducated executives in the most important cultural institution in this country. So you're saying the sense of preservation, the importance of preservation. Richard? I, I mean, I, th I, I, I obviously, I kind of really lament that kind of story. You do hear it enough, and I think it's, it, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to funding. But it also comes down to policy, and I think you know, part of what we're all doing is trying to draw emphasis to the role that libraries and archives play. And that core idea of preserving knowledge, which is at the heart of why I wrote my book, needs to be emphasized because there are decision makers can choose where to place their budget, you know, and preserving knowledge for the sake of society as a whole is what we need to kind of emphasize the importance of. And sometimes it doesn't need to be, you know, perhaps the BBC might want to spend its money on other things, but there are other organizations, the one we're sat in at the moment, the National Archives, many other organizations that could take on that role. And there's been a lot of history of libraries and archives being sort of, you know, taken over, given custodianship by other institutions when there are issues like the one you describe. So I think it's just we need to be constantly reminding those decision makers of the power of preserving knowledge, not, not for today, but for tomorrow. This is not about the past, it's about the future. Thank you. Any other questions? We've uh, right the front. Thank you. Uh, very engaging uh, talk, everybody really enjoyed that. Um, just, just listening to Satnam, his life almost mirrors mine. I come from a Sikh, big Sikh family. Um, I used to go to the library just to get away from the noise and have a bit of peace and, and space to myself. Um, but it's always a building full of stories and, um, and, and history. Um, also, encyclopedias were my thing in, in, those, in those days before Google. But anyway, the question I wanted to ask was, um, um, I, I prefer the, the hard paper copy of books and the work and the effort that goes into the artwork. I just want a question for the, the authors on the, on the stage. Um, I mean, I, I know this, we're going towards a digital world and people have got more access to your words through digital media. However, what's your preference when it comes to digital versus uh, paper? But also, how much effort do you put into the actual design and the feel and the look of the book? 
Something. Yeah, actually, I was thinking about that whilst you were answering that question, and they got the question from the back, because if I can have a whinge about this place, copyright libraries now, you know, copyright libraries have a duty to collect everything that's ever published, right? But in the British Library now, they don't collect the hard copies necessarily. They often have a digital-only policy. I tried to look up one of these digital books, which you can't buy anywhere else, and I just couldn't read it, because the, way, the file was just not well presented, going to what you're what you're saying there. And I think, I think copyright libraries should preserve the actual books so that we can actually see them. And it's not necessarily an old fashioned thing to say. I think nowadays, there's a very different experience between the digital experience and the physical experience. Physical books are still being read and they haven't been killed by digital media. I think you should preserve both. Can I just respond to that, which I think is a very fair comment. It's you're not alone in thinking this. Um, there was a change to the legislation in 2013 which allowed publishers to choose which format they wish to deposit in. Um, and there are many publishers who don't publish in print anymore, so it's not an, an, an inescapable reality. Um, I, I think there is going to be a consultation later in this year um, around the way that the 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 regulations of 2013 that you know allowed this to happen have been implemented i was chair, i chaired the implementation group for the six it's your fault it's, <laughs> it's 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 we had we had legislation passed to us that we had to implement so please when that consultation comes up make your points known because that's the only way that we can be able to you know sensibly you know respond to the real needs of readers. And in slight mitigation, we do also, in addition, uh, on our own back, purchase physical books uh, where what gets delivered to us through legal deposit is digital. We will then go out and obtain the physical copy for exactly the reasons that, that you say. It's not comprehensive, the scale of it is impossible, but we do do that. Um, but thank you for raising that. Um, and thank you for your question. Jamie, uh, can Lady I jump in for a second? Yes, very quickly, of course. Um, yeah, so the digital question in India, it's often um, uh, premised on the idea that it'll be cheaper or that somehow it'll be in increased access because cheaper, because it's an app and you can send it to people and so on. But uh, reading requires communities. Knowledge is built by people collectively. It's not done individually. And I think the digital answer often isolates people from one another. Uh, digital access doesn't build community in quite the same way. This is especially critical in India because when you're a first generation school goer, when your parents don't know how to read and you come in to the library, you're coming into a space where you can meet other people who share your reality and then enter the world of books and so on, where I think digital can be an added um, resource for people and not, um, not the only resource. But yeah, one of the other trends in the Indian library landscape is this, let's get the cheaper answer and let's not build the public library system. Um, so. Quick plug for us, one of our exhibitions, our major exhibition is on animals. We have a second exhibition about digital storytelling and the ways that stories can be told only through digital, that when stories are created through digital tools, that there's a whole load of play with narrative uh, that wouldn't be possible in a physical book. So I, I don't think any of us is saying it's either or. Um, it's richer than that. Uh, we've got a question at the front, and that's probably going to have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, and I agree with everything that... that you've been saying about the importance of libraries in communities. But I just wonder what you realistically think in terms of the future when we are child young children can readily access books online through places like Amazon, whether technology is actually a hindrance or a help and whether going forward re realistically and with the funding issues, can libraries survive in the way that we have known them and loved them and, and, and going forward, or, or does there need to be a significant shift and acknowledgement? Great question. We're going to do a quick, uh, quick fire round, a uh, sentence each for everyone. Can libraries survive? Do we need libraries when uh, we've got phones? Start with Lara. Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's, not, it's not just fire. that. Um, but I, I do think uh, you're absolutely right. Things are evolving and libraries do need to evolve. There needs to be more. So they are this, you know, amazing places of knowledge, but they need to be more as well. So community and other things too. Satnam? Um, I, I actually think with AI, you know, there's a view that we don't need libraries anymore. We need them even more. Because if you look at all the research about the future of education, 
we have to train our children to be more human, to be different from robots. And libraries are exercises, exercises in the human experience, aren't they? And uh, I think we're going to need them more, not less. Richard? Um, Lara and Satnam said everything that I think really... Um, I, and I, I think it's not an either-or. I don't think there's a binary. I think the place, you know, since the pandemic, the reading rooms in my library system have never been busier. Our physical spaces, the BL, I know, is an absolute kind of thriving hub of that physical community. Me, you know, the public library systems remain, the ones that are still surviving, remain thriving places for community. But we use digital technologies as well to enhance and reach people who can't come to the Bodleian or the BL or, 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 or wherever. So I, it's not an either or, but we've got to be really thoughtful and careful about how we adopt the digital technologies for the reasons that have been said. Last word to you, Madula. I don't think uh, uh, people have ever um, been successful at thinking alone and away from one another. So a physical library with physical books is an absolute must for people coming together to have discussions. I mean, just I think you can hold a thought for maybe seven seconds in your mind. If you don't pass that ball to somebody else, it's going to drop to the ground. Uh, if, you, if we keep it going back and forth, then yeah, then we create the next generation and the next generation of knowledge and thinking. Uh, there is no way forward other than with libraries. And if you are seeing libraries getting diminished or arguing arguments for diminishing libraries, it is because that is a conservative tendency and it is right now a very conservative world. If we have libraries in places in this world, it's because people struggled for that to be there. So I think there is a long historic view we need to take with libraries to understand when protests happen in Delhi or in New York, the Occupy movement in the United States, every single location of protest had a physical library yeah. with physical books. Yeah, yeah. Four answers that I hope give you hope. Uh, no way forward other than with libraries was what Majula said. So let's, uh, on that, close this session by thanking all of our panelists uh, enormously for what was a wonderful conversation. Thank you.